Explorers Club has over 100 years of history. It promotes scientific exploration by supporting research and edu education in the physical, natural, and biological sciences. Here to tell us more about the Explorers Club is President Alan Nichols. Welcome, sir. Ah, glad to be here. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the history of the Explorers Club? Yes, you mentioned it's over 100 years old. It's a club of explorers, as distinguished, not publishers or anything. All the members of the Explorers Club explore themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it is. It was formed uh, by 50 explorers, in the original ones, Amundsen, who was the first to go to the South Pole, Admiral Perry, first to go to the North Pole, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that's been going on for a hundred years. And what does it mean to be an explorer? How does one become uh, an Explorers Club well, member? There's a a process. You have to be nominated and sponsors and all that kind of stuff. But you're an explorer. We're all explorers. The human species, we have this exploration gene, actually, and they don't, haven't identified the gene, <laughs> but that's how we survive. And the people who are in the explorers are just a little more active at it than others. So if you want to join, uh, all you got to do is take an expedition and we'll make you an explorer. And how did you become part of the Explorers Club? What was your great exploration? Um, I'm, since there's only two experts in the world, I can call myself one of the two experts on the world on sacred mountains. Okay. So I've climbed and written about and talked about sacred mountains all over the world uh, for a lot of years now. And that's been the essence of my own exploration. Mm -hmm. And then that gets me off onto tax. Uh, you know, the lost mountain climbers, and I'm looking for the tomb of Chinggis Khan now, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And what, what is a sacred mountain? Sacred mountain is a mountain that plays an important part in some religion. If you just think about, think of Mount Olympus. Mm -hmm. If you're a people and you're going to put your gods on the top of a mountain, mm -hmm. it's going to be sacred. You're gonna talk, if you're Moses and you're going to go talk to God, you're going to do it at the top of a mountain. If you're going to have pilgrims, they're going to climb mountains. And so it goes on and on that way mm -hmm. in that there is no religion, and I've studied them all, but <laughs> not all of them, but all certainly ones we've heard of, and they all at some point in their history, a mountain, or a high point at least, becomes very important, has a special role. Mm -hmm. That's what sacred mountains are about. And what, what was it about those mountains that intrigued you? Was it something that... Uh, you read as a little boy or something that you grew to love? Yeah, it's a natural for me because I'm very interested, always have been in religions. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience while I was trying a law case in Arizona that kind of just came to me. I tried to research the question and there were no books on the subject. Mm -hmm. Amazingly enough, there's a thousand million books on mountains right. and more on religions. They didn't put them together. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a career putting the mountains and the religions together, which means I kind of self-hypnotize myself. <laughs> it means I research the religion and I find out about it. So it's a natural for me. What has been your favorite mountain <laughs> that you've discovered? Or I always explored? get that. Favorite mountain. Uh, it's kind of, um, people ask me also, what's my favorite religion? And the answer oh. is I've never found a religion I don't like. And I've never <laughs> found a mountain I don't like. But probably, one of the more interesting ones, I was the first person, uh, Westerner, after Tibet was opened, to circumambulate, to go around Mount Kailas in southwest Tibet. And that's a, that's a holy mountain to all Buddhists. Mm -hmm. It's called Miru, the connection between earth and, and heaven. Mm -hmm. And it's a Hindu place. If you're a Hindu, you see this mountain and you found Mukti, means you found it. So it's a really important. I have some important, wonderful experiences there. What, well then, if that's your favorite, what was your least favorite experience? Wow. Least favorite experience? I, uh, I guess the, you'd have to say it's least favorite because uh, it was so uh, uh, dangerous mm -hmm. to me. And, uh, and that was actually Mount Lassen in California. That's a sacred mountain to the original Native Americans that were there. It was a tribal totem, absolutely secret. They had no evidence, even though they've studied those Native Americans. But I, uh, I tried a different route down the mountain, and I ended up 36 hours uh, lost and all that. So you were exploring yeah, and got a little lost. I was exploring. That's part of the that's part of the price of it. But 
it, that's I mean, you always have that. And the other thing about all these things is there are always people mm -hmm. who seem to come at the right time to save you when you do foolish things. Oh, what is it? What is your next expedition? Uh, right now, my big key out of Sake Mountains, uh, the Mongols, uh, and remember Genghis Khan, mm -hmm. the greatest warrior that conquered more territory than anybody in history, both before his time and afterwards. Mm -hmm. So. He died about 750 years ago. Marco Polo started looking for his grave, mm -hmm. and they've been looking for it for 750 years. He has to be buried on a sacred mountain in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And so that's my present quest. I found something called Mountain X, and we've done magnetometry and found there's anomalies under there. So right now, that's my current, I call it Mountain X. It's actually has a different <laughs> name, but it's, uh, not anything I tell anybody where it is. Oh, uh, how many sacred mountains are there in Mongolia that you have to search there? Well, uh, there's innumerable ones, but in north they call Barkhan Khaldun. Mm -hmm. That's where he was brought up. That's where he prayed to Tongri, his the god up there. That's where everybody thinks he was buried, and he wrote, or his family wrote a book after he died, mm -hmm. and made people think that's where he was buried, but he was a master of deception. <laughs> he didn't want anybody to find his, so they've been spending millions of dollars by they, Western explorers, to trying to find his tomb in recent times. Mm -hmm. Millions of dollars, and they're only about a thousand air miles away from where he was actually buried. So he what, succeeded. What, make, what makes you believe then that he's buried in the, in the one that you're searching at? Uh, there's about 10 factors, and I spent a lot of time researching. I was making a talk in Dallas, mm -hmm. and a professor from SMU comes up, Johan, he comes up to me, and he says, you're interested in sacred mountains. We, a very small minority of us, believe they're looking for Genghis Khan's tomb in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm not really involved in that kind of archaeology and so forth. But he said, well, but you're interested in sacred mountains and you're giving a talk about them and you're going to be bicycling. I was at that time bicycling from Istanbul to Xi'an, 10,000 miles on a bicycle. Wow. When we crossed the Yellow River, and I was telling him that was my next portion of this, he said, when you cross the Yellow River, go to Hohat in Inner Mongolia and you're going to see the Yin Mountains on your left as you go to Hohat. In those mountains, is where Genghis Khan was buried. So I was about a day and a half ahead of time. So we got in the sag wagon and drove to Hohat when we were doing that cycling journey from mm -hmm. Kashgar to Xi'an. Went all along these mountains. They're all beautiful, beautiful mountains. They're all batholithic, like the Sierras. Right. Gorgeous. Oh my God. There's. How can you ever find the sacred mountain? So I was seeing them. We got there. And we spent too much time in Hohat. So I had to get back by <laughs> sea. We come back. The sun is just coming up, early morning sun. We're going along this mountain. There, I see a mountain. And I say to my wife, Becky, who is with me in the sideway, that's it. We go around the mountain, and on the top of this mountain, non-climbable mountain, it's just a cliff like this, right. is a cupola, a little shrine. So I know it's a sacred mountain. I know it wouldn't be from 750 years ago. I know that's a sacred mountain. So I've been back three times. We've done magnetometry on that particular mountain. But it has to be, he has to be buried to carry out his mission. He has to be buried within 14 days of when he died mm. because of the shaman religion he believed in. And so anyway, there's about 10 of those factors that this place satisfied. But it doesn't count until you actually confirm it. Well, that's that's pretty amazing. So you also went to the Tantan this year, and we're going to take a little look at the package about that. The Bronx is one of the most diverse counties in the nation, but there is also around the world places where cultures are being lost. That's why UNESCO designates several points of the world as intangible monuments for humanity. One of those places is in Morocco, a friend of the Bronx. This year, the Explorers Club was a guest of honor at the Musem de Tantan. The president of the Explorers Club, Mr. Alan Nichols, who we've been speaking to, gave his speech at the festival. Let's take a look. Tantan, a town in desert in southwest Morocco, is chosen for the historical festival, Museum, 
that bring Sahrawi together to celebrate their culture and traditions. While many traditions around the world are in danger of disappearing, Museum de Tantan was proclaimed as one of the masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO in 2005. Due to the security problem in the region in the mid-70s, authorities at the time banned the festival. But in 2004, with the support of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, UNESCO's goodwill ambassador, Kitty Munoz, brought this magnificent event back to life. This year, the Explorers Club was a guest of honor at the Museum de Tantan. Alan Nichols, the president of the Explorers Club, states that the exploration is in our DNA. I'm Alan Nichols, and I'm an explorer. As a matter of fact, each of you are also explorers. As fellow human beings, it's in our DNA, it's in our bones. Nichols also mentions Moroccan's long history of their explorations. We know about exploration in Africa for the last hundreds of years. Morocco knows about exploration of Africa for the last thousands of years, at least since the time of the Phoenicians. We all know about Marco Polo. But the Moroccan explorer, Ibn Battuta, traveled five times as many countries and distances in those very same years. Last March, King Mohammed VI sent his special advisor to the United States to meet with the Explorers Club at their annual dinner in New York. We talked about how the Explorers Club and Morocco can work together for global exploration, especially in Morocco, Africa, and the Middle East. In 2014, UNESCO's goodwill ambassador, Kitty Munoz, will sail from Morocco to New York. Nichols promises a full support for this expedition. The flags of Morocco and the Explorers Club will fly together on this vessel. We will welcome you with open arms when you arrive, just as you have welcomed us with open arms. An event like this is vital for explorers around the world. And the Explorers Club was honored to take part. For BronxNet, this is Christy Takahashi. And so we're back. We're going to talk with the president of the Explorers Club, Mr. Alan Nichols, about his exploration in the Tantan. Could you tell us uh, what did that trip really mean to you? How did you feel when you were there experiencing all these, these wonderful sights and sounds? It was so important to me because I told you I was like to bike ride and I did a lot of research about the Sahara because I wanted to bike across the Sahara. Mm -hmm. To actually be there with those people who were maintaining their tradition was really very exciting. My only regret is that we just weren't there long enough okay. to really see it. And the other part of it is that where Tantan is, right next to the sea, mm -hmm. so you have both the sea and the famous Sahara Desert. That's a thrilling place to be. It was pretty thrilling. Uh, what was your favorite part about being there? Even though I know it was a very short trip, very whirlwind, got there, go, move, move. What was your favorite part about being there? My very, without a doubt, the really favorite part is after you saw it in the pictures of the, the horsemen riding. Mm -hmm. I have a ranch in California and so I've done a lot of cattle and all this business. So uh, actually I went down and met the horsemen who and talked to them and their horses mm -hmm. uh, and it's extraordinary. They I mean they have, there was about 30 groups, 30 different tribes, each with these very good horses and you know, galloping at full speed and firing their heads. I mean, that was really exciting. And then the Moroccans themselves, especially the young kids, I mean, they were just so enthusiastic and hospitality. I mean, that was really the high point for me. What, what's the connection between the Explorers Club and the and Morocco? Uh, we have, we're in a joint project to emphasize world exploration. If I asked you, in the name of some explorers, mm -hmm. you'd maybe say Livingston. You'd meet a lot of people, and they are people.
people going from West-centered world, we go to Africa or we go somewhere else, not realizing or not understanding that's the end of that kind of exploration. Mm -hmm. The exploration now is world-centered rather than West-centered. And that's what this is all getting to. King Mohammed VI, His Majesty, is behind this program. He's going to send a reed boat from Morocco to New York, this Tantan Festival bring Saharans from all over. So we need to understand that while we think we're exploring some country, that country's already had explorers for longer than we've been exploring. That's pretty amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Love to be with you. <laughs> Hope that's helpful. It's been a pleasure coming into your homes. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast at 10 p.m. on Cablevision Channel 67, Fios 33, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Have a great week, and don't forget to keep your heart, your mind, and most of all, this channel wide open. Have a great day.